In this segment, we're going to talk about conditional random fields. This is going to be a model alternative to hidden Markov models that is still going to allow us to incorporate sequential structure, but is now going to allow us to do it in the context of a discriminative model. But first, let's talk about named entity recognition, which we're going to use as our motivating example here. So named entity recognition is roughly the following problem. If we have a sentence like Barack Obama will travel to Hangzhou today for the G20 meeting, we want to identify that there are some chunks of uh, essentially sequences of words in this sentence that correspond to real world entities. And we want to label those entities with what type they are. For example, Barack Obama is a person, Hangzhou is a location, and the G20 is an organization. The way we're going to do this is we're going to treat it as a tagging problem. So we can do this by encoding these chunks in with what's called a BIO tag site and or tag set. And BIO stands for begin, inside, and outside. And so the way this works is the first word in a uh, chunk will always get the B tag with the associated type. That's what B dash per means. And then I dash per indicates that this chunk continues. Now, if we had B dash per, B dash per, what that would be saying is that Barack and Obama are two separate person chunks that just happen to be next to each other. So we can encode basically chunks that are next to each other or um, you know, long chunks by continuing with I's. Uh, and then we have B lock and B org. And then O just means not in any chunk. So this is a sequence of tags. So we could just throw an HMM at this problem, and we've already developed all the machinery to do that. But it might not work so well here. And the reasons are twofold. The first is that there's going to be a lot of O's. So HMMs are these models that kind of get dependence between uh, adjacent words based on the tag set, right? Um, each word is conditionally independent of all the others given its tag. And when you have O's, we're not moving information around, and the words aren't kind of influencing each, each other to the extent that they are when um, we have all these fine-grained part of speech tags like present tense verb. And the second problem is that uh, the way we defined our HMMs was using these multinomial distributions over transitions and emissions. We just basically said, OK, what's the probability of this word given this tag? And that's actually not going to work very well here because a lot of the action here is in unknown words, which maybe aren't in our like fixed HMM vocabulary. Now, there's ways to take HMMs and, and kind of relax those restrictions. But instead, we're just going to kind of set that framework aside and try to do something different. And so what CRFs are going to do is they're going to allow us to build something that looks a lot more like logistic regression, but now in a structured fashion. And so when we think about predicting this B per tag, for example, we are going to be able to use features that say things like the current word is Barack, the next word is Obama, the current word starts with a capital letter. You can imagine that that's a very useful tag uh, or feature in English for determining whether something is part of a named entity. Um, you know, its position in the sentence is it's at the start of a sentence, right? Um, and then we can look at things like the kind of label and the next label. So this is going to let us specify a much more flexible set of features that's going to allow us to handle this problem. All right, let's talk about now the basics of CRFs and how those are going to allow us to get there. So these are a very flexible model that, in general, has the following form. Uh, P of y given x, so now this is a discriminative model, so it conditions on x, equals 1 over z times a product over uh, the exponential of a bunch of so-called potential functions phi k of x comma y. And these phi k's are any real valued scoring functions of their arguments. Um, there's kind of no restrictions on them as long as they return some real numbers. And then this z is a normalizer. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit. So these potentials are responsible for looking at x and y. And each one is going to assign a score to, the, con the, to like, the configuration of those variables. And typically, they're going to look at just a subset of the variables in x and y. We are going to specifically think about the case of linear feature-based potentials. And so when I 
talk about uh, well, when I talk about linear using linear features, this is going to kind of call back to the ideas from linear classification. We are going to think about having a set of features fk that get extracted based on x and y. So this is going to be something like a kind of vector of indicators. And then we have uh, our weight vector w. And so in, in this form, we can rewrite the CRF in, in the following form. And this is, a, this is a special case of the more general model. And the cool thing about this is, OK, setting the z aside, if we just focus on this kind of uh, this term inside the exponential, this doesn't look so different from how we were dealing with uh, multi-class logistic regression. We had uh, an exponential of weights transpose features using this, uh, you know, using this different features approach, and so having one single weight vector here. And that connection is going to be very important for helping us understand how learning is going to work in CRFs. All right, so in general, uh, so the x's are observed and the y's aren't observed. So I'm drawing a picture over here where these x nodes are shaded to indicate that they're conditioned on, um, and the y's are not. And then we have these fee, these different fees here that correspond to um, uh, the different features. So uh, basically, each square represents what we call uh, one of these potentials, and uh, phi k corresponds to a set of features f k and touches the set of nodes that it depends on. So the problem is that in general, CRF inference is intractable. So what we need to do in order to actually make this thing a probability distribution is to compute z, which requires summing over all possible sequences y. And the reason is that uh, you know, we haven't placed too many constraints on what's happening inside this exponential over here. We have no clever tricks for figuring out how to make this thing normalize into a probability distribution besides just summing everything up. Uh, and in general, when we can't exploit any structure about the computation, um, we're, we're kind of in trouble. And even computing the best, uh, the, the kind of most likely configuration of variables, again, this requires uh, taking an argmax over all possible settings of the y's, and this is also intractable. So the, these, are, these are going to be exponential uh, time operations in general, and uh, that's not going to work very well. And so this is going to lead us to specialize the CRF uh, to something that looks uh, a little bit more amenable for the NER task. And the way we're going to do that is by using a special form called a sequential CRF. Um, there's a few different ways and, and a kind of a few different notations you can use to define this. Um, right here, I'm giving one that's going to be most immediately useful for uh, NER and also part of speech tagging and is, is generally going to be flexible enough to handle most problems. So what we have here is we have two types of potentials. So we have first a product from i equals 2 to n of potentials that are looking at adjacent pairs of y's. So now our y's are in the sequence here um, because we're doing sequence labeling. And second, we have a product over uh, some potentials that look at only a single yi, but then also the index i and the raw sentence x. So these factors we're going to call transition potentials and emission potentials. Uh, and just as a point of notation, in this factor graph here, we've omitted x from it. Technically, there's no sort of additional computational cost or, uh, or sort of theoretical cost to having every potential be able to look at all of x because x is conditioned on. This is the big difference between CRFs and HMMs. So we so we've got this thing here that's a little bit funky, but you know if you kind of blur your eyes, it looks pretty similar to the pictures that we were drawing for HMMs. And so let's specialize this further into this log linear case with transition and emission features. And so all I've done here is we've taken our weight vector w out, outside of all these sums and products, and now inside this exponential, uh, you know, inside a single exponential, we're looking at summing up 
features associated with each transition, yi minus one to yi, and then also features associated with each emission uh, at the ith step uh, when you label it with label yi. So the kicker is that this structure is going to allow us to compute these nasty operations like, like summing up to get z or uh, maxing over uh, all possible tag sets to get a prediction. We're going to be able to do that with dynamic programming. And that's going to be that, that's going to allow us to take this previously intractable model uh, and actually make it tractable. So just to kind of compare and contrast, CRFs we've seen in this form. And I'm going to write that here with this product of terms to look maximally similar to what we just saw with CRFs. And the CRF that we just defined looks like this. And so both of these models are expressible in, in this relatively similar factor graph notation. HMMs look like Bayes nets, and CRFs, um, again, are drawing on this idea of, of, of factor graphs or Markov random fields, conditional random fields, sort of undirected graphical models. And these exponentiated potentials are going to play similar roles as probabilities. So uh, you know, setting aside the issue of normalization, we see that there's a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between the exponentiated transitions and the transition probabilities in HMMs, and then exponentiated emissions and uh, the emission probabilities in HMMs. So the idea here is that in, C in HMMs, the emissions were only able to consider one word at a time when we were thinking about features. And now CRFs are gonna be much more flexible. They're gonna allow us to define emission features like we were seeing a few slides ago, um, where we could think about, for this tag, what, what the next word is, or even two or three words down the road, um, and kind of understand how the context influences the tagging decisions. And this is because we're no longer using a generative model. Um, and so, uh, the kind of analogy I want to draw is that naive Bayes is to logistic regression as HMMs are to CRFs. Uh, the distinction here is between locally and globally normalized models. So at HMMs, for HMMs, each decision in the model is a probability distribution that normalizes, and CRFs don't have that property. We have to compute this Z to make it normalize. Uh, and this is also tied up with the distinction between generative and discriminative models. So CRFs are discriminative. They model P of X, P of Y given X, and HMMs model the joint distribution P of X comma Y. So this kind of sets the stage for how CRFs are going to enable us to do better at this task and how we're going to make them tractable by drawing this analogy to HMMs and leveraging the same kinds of algorithms for doing inference. That's the end of this segment.